Testing. One, two, three, four, five. Test out.
This is one of the satellites we launched last year. This is going to fly by to go to Saturn. All right. All right. I see that limited edition. All kinds of pens. I'm working on it. I'm just going to do that. Hi, how are you? I will move a mountain for half. 
This is uh this is the Cassini. We're we're with the, fit, the fifth space launch squadron. We launched a Titan IV rocket. We did model that down here. And uh, one of our previous launches, which was in October last year, was the Cassini. We launched in. It's gonna take seven years to get there. Once it's once it's there, we're gonna look at it in four years. Look at the rings of Saturn, uh, some of its moons. Well, hopefully we'll learn a lot from it. Uh, uh, we have a friend who's a different size. Working on the Delta. Hey, I appreciate it. I will work to my best. I know. What's your special job? I'm dealing with you. Let me find out. Then I'll know. Where did you trust me, is it? Oh, I'm, I'm a man. Yeah, I'm yeah. a man. Yeah. 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 But I have a big one. We're going to do what? One of them. Actually, uh, two of them still work. Yeah. 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 I don't know what the plans are for the other two, but all of them are in pretty bad shape, uh, sitting out there in the weather for all the years. I imagine, yeah. I was really surprised. It'll be uh, worthwhile anyway. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're fun to play around with, though. This is taking a break. Yeah. Black is actually on. Please remain standing for our, for our national anthem, which will be sung today by Captain Darren Buck, Range Control Officer for the 45th Range Squadron. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed us through the perilous fight or oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the that you imparted to scientists to allow us to accomplish such a feat. Thank you for all who were connected with that momentous event. Since then, our knowledge of space has greatly increased along with space-related technology. We are humbled by the awesome ability we possess today in the space arena, but are ever thankful for the gift of knowledge that result in wonderful accomplishments. Bless this ceremony today our guests and speakers as they share with us. Let their words of inspiration form a lasting memory. Amen. The commander of the 45th Space Wing, Brigadier General Randall Starbuck. Uh, 
uh, thank you very much. Uh, God and country, that's what it's all about. Uh, I really appreciate, Larry, uh, you doing the prayer, and Darren, uh, you doing the national anthem. That was absolutely superb, and I would like to give a hand to, uh, to them for uh, their support of the ceremony today. Uh, it is a pleasure for uh, me to be here today to uh, uh, MC today's ceremony and also to see uh, so many great uh, patriots out here. It's interesting that you uh, look up on the uh, on the dais here and uh, you look at these people and they kind of look different and they kind of look the same and they all look different, but I'd like to take you back to 1976, which is about halfway between where we are and 1958. Um, when this all started on January the 31st, 1958. Uh, Captain Perryman and Captain J.B. Kump on the two ends there were stationed at uh, the 3rd Tech Fighter Wing at Clark Air Base of the Philippines. And they haven't seen each other before today except for at a 1950s party that they went to back at the O Club at Clark Air Base of the Philippines in 1976. And, uh, I'm sure you're saying that I'm making this up, and I'm really not. I got the photos to prove it. So if you want to uh, <laughs> come and see me afterwards, I'll show you the photos of Captain Perryman and Captain Kump being captains in 1976. Uh, also in 1976, Major General Retired Morrell was finishing up the Air Command and Staff College. It was the Air Force Air Command and Staff College, and today it's the Air Force Command and Staff College but really it's the Air and Space Force Command and Staff College. And Mr. Baker was finishing up the University of Flor uh, Central Florida uh, with a degree in history. So we bring together uh, this group of people to talk to you about uh, the history. Uh, the first speaker that we have uh, this morning, uh, our keynote speaker is uh, uh, my boss, the commander of the 14th Air Force Flying Tigers at Vandenberg Air Force Base, California, Major General Jerry Perriman. I'm just glad that you didn't have a system to show with a vis aid those pictures in 1976. And we'll have to wrestle him to, to get them away from him. Distinguished visitors, uh, members of the Explorer One team, members of the 45th Space Wing, and friends and neighbors, I'm delighted to join you. Anniversary of Explorer One, which marks the birth of America's space program. It was here at Cape Canaveral exactly 40 years ago that the foundation was laid that would establish America's leadership in both space exploration and in the use of space. Now, I wasn't here January 31st, 1958, but a bunch of the folks here present with us this morning were. And I'd like the members of the Explorer One program team to stand and be recognized, if you'd do so. Anybody that had a hand in launching that, or building it, or making it up. You're our heroes. All of us who were alive at that time looked with awe at what you had accomplished. And those who have been born since that time continue to look with awe at what you accomplished. January 31st, 1958. That was the day that America established itself in a domain that has evolved into an instrument of national power and prestige. Our space endeavors have also prompted dozens of spinoffs that have practical application in all of our daily lives. In a sense, all that the space program is today, we owe to Explorer One. Every time we make a phone call, or watch a television show, you're probably using satellite technology that in many ways can be directly linked to that small spacecraft launched back in the 50s when you could still get a hamburger for a quarter. When you think about it, 40 years isn't really all that long. It's astonishing how far our society and our space program have gone. It's kind of fun to look back. Somebody showed me a, a, the missile air the base newspaper for Patrick Air Force Base, dated January 1958. You look back to that time frame, some of you in this crowd who are quite young won't, won't realize this, but you could have bought a brand new three-bedroom home right here in Brevard County for the amazing sum of 
$2,395. That same, that same newspaper had an ad in it, too, that I found interesting. It advertised a diaper service with twice-weekly pickup, or correction, twice-weekly de delivery. That's the point. It didn't mention a pickup service, so I guess it was hard to get anybody to do that job. Maybe that's why we've got Pampers a little bit later. Anyway, we've definitely come a long way. In January 1958, that eventually evolved into today's 45th Space Wing, was then called the Air Force Missile Test Center. The launch of Explorer 1 took the old AFMTC from the missile era directly into the space age. And we've been there ever since. For four decades, the 45th Space Wing and its precursors have been at the forefront of assuring access to space for hundreds of military, NASA, and commercial satellites from right here, America's eastern spaceport. And it all started with a little tiny Explorer 1 that weighed a little less than 31 pounds. Its mission then was to detect cosmic radiation and micrometeorite impacts. We didn't know what we were going to find up there. But on that first satellite of America, it made a very significant and important discovery as it orbited the Earth. It is credited with finding the Van Allen radiation belt as it orbited at speeds of more than 17,000 miles an hour. Under the name of Project Deal, Explorer 1 was launched with the guidance of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Army's Ballistic Missile Agency. Just 84 days after it was authorized, that in itself is amazing. Explorer 1 was to ride into space aboard a Vanguard rocket, but when that vehicle ran into problems, the Army's modified Redstone booster, known as Jupiter C, was used instead. The legacy of Explorer 1 is mind-boggling. Today, space is a national security center of gravity, an area of vital humanitarian and commercial global interest, and it all started right here with Explorer 1. So this is hallowed ground, ladies and gentlemen. Complex 26 is to the space age what Kitty Hawk and Detroit were to the industrial age. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to those pioneers, the Explorer 1 team, the scientists, the technicians, who made Explorer 1 launch on a Jupiter C booster a technological and historical success. Like the Wright brothers and Henry Ford, they had a profound effect on the world. They changed the course of history and ushered America toward the future. What a legacy. The tiny Explorer 1 spacecraft they launched exceeded all expectations. It eventually made 58,000 orbits around the Earth before it finally came in over the Pacific in a fiery re-entry on March 31st, 1970. In its wake arose the most dynamic space program on the planet, and the best is yet to come. So I'm delighted that so many of you are here to mark this occasion, to remember the Explorer 1 that paved the way for America's preeminence in space. Thank you. General Perryman. Um, our next speaker is, uh, is a guy who is a personal friend and a mentor of mine, uh, former commander of the 45th Space Wing and currently uh, the chairman of the Air Force Space and Missile Museum Foundation, uh, Major General Retired Jimmy Morrell. tall, skinny guys that are not like us short, fat guys when we retire. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the Space and Missile Museum Foundation. Uh, we are the co-sponsors of this event, along with uh, the United States Air Force. Now, let me say here very quickly, General Starbuck, that uh, as the last commander of the Eastern Space and Missile Center and the first commander of the 45th Space Wing, when I look out here and see the effort that has gone on to make this event happen, you and your people make me pretty proud. So thank you very much, and let's begin. Now, for J.B. Kump and uh, General Paramount, let me just tell you that the world truly is a small place. 
I, too, am a former 3rd TAC Fighter Wing member. Yeah. A, a little earlier than these guys, probably. Uh, but the fact of it is, is that I served with the 3rd TAC Fighter Wing in Vietnam in 69 and 70, and my old wing commander lives over in Indian River Colony Club, Howard McLean, and he was a wing commander there in Vietnam. So we're all over the place. You can't get rid of 3rd TAC Fighter Wing guys. Uh, let me also tell you that I would be remiss in my duty here today if I didn't talk to you a moment about the foundation. What is the foundation? The foundation is a group of volunteers, people who are dedicated to the preservation of the memories, the history, and the tradition of our space program. Those volunteers you will see running around here today in their blue shirts and hats. They, uh, we could double their pay tomorrow and it wouldn't cost us a nickel. <laughs> In addition to that, the foundation is dedicated to trying to raise money to maintain these facilities, to build with the vision of the Air Force a large visitor center here at Cape Canaveral for the preservation of these activities and the memory of these activities. I would truly be remiss if I didn't encourage you to consider joining us and helping us in those efforts. We need your help. But more importantly, the history of the space program in America needs your help. You know, we all come to these events trying to figure out what the right words are going to be so we can uh, sound good on the podium. Today was particularly challenging. And it was challenging because this place has so many memories and so many events that have been here and been part of this great history. It's also trying to find a place that we can recognize properly what these folks that preceded us have done. This field, these block houses, they've been called lots of things. A field of dreams. A great place where great technological achievements were accomplished. A cornerstone location for the heritage of the American space program. A place where a clear victory in the Cold War was won. It was won because a rocket on a podium, excuse me, on a uh, platform just like you see behind us, which is an old drilling rig, and that's all it was, a modified drilling rig platform, was launched into space because some people believed and tried. Over the years, we have often heard clarion calls. The U.S. is lost in space. The American people do not care about space or what you do. Why do you care? Those guys in the space business are wasting our money and misdirecting our country. Now, what I've said before about that is we have indeed accomplished great feats in this country and in the space program. And as General Perriman said, it's no longer an Air Force. And as General Starbucks said, it's no longer an Air Command and Staff College. It's an Air and Space Force. And that only occurred because of the people that preceded us, whether they be Army, Navy, or Air Force. What we have failed to do, however, in our space program is create a soul in the belief of what we do. Not support for a project, not support for an event, but a soul, a spiritual belief in what we do. And more importantly, why you do it. Now, as a young man, I remember the launch of Explorer 1. I was 12 years old. It captured the imagination of my peers and the American public. When I told that to my wife today, she said, no, not really. And I said, yes, it did. I said, it was one of the motivating experiences that we could really do this. What was done here in Explorer 1 was accomplished by a very few people. I happened to look in the paper this morning and there was an article by a, a gentleman that had been here in that block house and he started listing all the people that were in there. It was clear General Starbuck, we didn't have any range safety then, there were 30 people in that block house. <laughs> Obviously a safety violation in that size facility. <laughs> Very few people by today's standards. And they did what they did in less than 90 days. That's an amazing accomplishment. And what they did has resulted in satellite programs that are here today and exist today that provide for the security of us all through weather, navigation, remote sensing, and military applications for security. Yeah, this program was a product of the Cold War, but it was the first victory. 
and it set the stage for our future in space. To the men and women of Explorer One's efforts, we can just say thank you. We can say that your efforts are the kind that began and will continue to create that soul of the American space program and ensure the future of mankind. Lofty words, but I mean them. We salute and thank you and why we do it. It says the message of past accomplishments and principles are there, but it doesn't do you any good. It doesn't do you or mankind any good if you don't mix that message with unfaltering faith. To you of Explorer One, I thank you for having the faith to do what you did. You said, I believe we can do it, and you did it. For you are here today, keep the faith in the American space efforts. For you who are here today, join our efforts to preserve the history and the foundation. Take the place of those like me and the Explorer One team as we fade away. Thank you. I uh, brought a couple of visual aids with me today. Uh, one is uh, this Polaris over here. Uh, uh, another is that matador uh, right behind you. And if you take a look at that matador behind you, you'll notice that uh, it has wings on it. And uh, our United States Air Force, you know, separated from uh, our parent organization, the U.S. Army, in September of 1947. And we were off in our space program and uh, our, actually our missile program, and we put wings on our missiles. Uh, meanwhile, our, our mother command, the United States Army, uh, kind of saw beyond the atmosphere, and, uh, and they did some things uh, that was right, and that's uh, they built rockets with no wings. And uh, this Explorer One, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, known to us as an as a Air Force program, certainly launches from Cape Canaveral, but really the Explorer One uh, was based on an Army rocket, and representing uh, that portion of our history, uh, we've invited uh, the uh, historian for the U.S. Army Aviation and Missile Command in Huntsville, Al Alabama, Mr. Mike Baker. Mike? They said they wanted a guy in Army Green, but uh, sometimes Army guys still have a hard time getting on airplanes. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is an honor and privilege to represent the United States Army and my commander, Major General Emmett Gibson, on this occasion. I sincerely appreciate your invitation to participate in an event so important to the history of the U.S. space program. On this day, 40 years ago, the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, or ABMA as it was better known, in association with the Jet Propulsion Lab, was responsible for launching Explorer 1. As the command historian for the U.S. Army Aviation and Missile Command, a successor of ABMA, I've had the opportunity to read numerous accounts and talk with many of those who actually participated in this truly historic event. The one thing that stands out to me the most is the spirit of teamwork exemplified which showed the world that the United States had the technology, the capability, and the will to compete in space. On the 4th of October 1957, the Secretary of Defense-elect was visiting Redstone Arsenal when news came that the Soviets had launched Sputnik 1, the first man made object into orbit about the Earth. The story goes that Dr. Werner von Braun, who was working for the Army at the time, asked to be given the green light and that the Army could launch a satellite in 60 days. His boss, Major General Medeiros, asked for a little longer, 90 days. About a month later, on November 3rd, the Soviet Union announced the launching of a second satellite, Sputnik 2. These Soviet satellites shattered American dreams of scientific and technical superiority. Amid mounting public pressure to respond to the Soviet challenge, the Army was given the go-ahead on November 8, 1957, to prepare Jupiter C to launch a U.S. satellite. As has been said earlier, just 84 days after receiving the mission, the Army launched Explorer 1. However, to be considered totally successful, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's Goldstone Tracking Station in California at midnight with these magical words, Goldstone has the bird. As new stories of the Explorer 1's launch began to surface, thousands of people gathered on the courthouse square in Huntsville, Alabama. Sirens wailed, horns blasted, and the sky filled with store-bought rockets and fireworks celebrating this country's first step toward the conquest of space. These cheers were echoed across the nation. Almost overlooked in the sheer national joy of having matched the Soviets in achievement was the fact that the Explorer 1 did the job 
that it was designed to do. Scientists later hailed confirmation of the Van Allen radiation belts by this satellite as the greatest single achievement of the International Geophysical Year. Forty years. Many soldiers and civilians who today come to work for the Army at Redstone Arsenal are amazed when they learn of the significant role that the Army played in laying the foundation for U.S. space exploration. From these roots grew a spirit of achievement, a legacy that continued even after the Army at Redstone lost its space mission. That legacy is a tradition of delivering what we promise in the management of high technology programs and that we must have nothing to fear from change. We must change if we want to effectively perform our primary mission of defending our country. One of the mottos of today's Army is total victory without casualties. Explorer 1 was clearly, clearly one of our most decisive victories. If there are any of you out there today that stood earlier who took part in the launching of Explorer 1, thank you. You are true explorers. Uh, Dr. Weldon, the congressman from the 15th Congressional District of uh, Florida, U.S. congressman, uh, called me. I had invited him to come to this ceremony. He was unable to make it, but uh, he did send uh, his representative, uh, Mr. J.B. Kemp. J.B.? Thank you, General Starbuck. It's amazing on this historic occasion how many historical rocks have been lifted up and how many historical facts have crawled out from underneath them. I'm pleased, for example, to find out that not only my old buddy Jerry Perryman is here this morning, but uh, that Jimmy Morrell actually served at Clark Air Base with the 3rd TAC Fighter Wing. It's amazing. I can still remember those words echoing in my ears that our squadron section commander, Captain Perryman, gave to us as we arrived on those shores, saying, we're going to do a better job of representing this nation downtown than some of our predecessors did. <laughs> I wasn't sure who he was talking about then, but uh, <coughs> you remember that, don't you, Jerry? No, not a thing. <laughs> Forty years ago, as many of those who have spoken this morning have indicated, we were in a race. In many ways, it was a race, we thought, for technological supremacy. What it turned out to be was a race to determine which political philosophy would dominate this globe. Many would say there are signs today that indicate that that race was won, not only technologically, but politically. But believe me, we don't need a Saddam Hussein to remind us that man's ability to be inhumane to fellow man is still there today. If it is not for the United States of America and its ability to use space as a platform to maintain peace, I fear for the future of this world. We then, therefore, have a need to continue to support for national defense and security and for the peace of this world these men and women you see in blue here today and those who preceded them in building the security that we now enjoy. But ladies and gentlemen, there's another race that we're involved in today, and we're involved in it in a very big way, both here on the Space Coast and the United States. And that's a race for jobs and the continuation of our way of life. It's a race for the commercial supremacy of space. It's a race that many Americans look to those who are actively involved in the space business here on the Space Coast to do today. Not only for the Space Coast, not only for Florida, but the United States of America. The United States Air Force is being asked to play a role in that job. Congressman Weldon asked me to give a word of thanks to General Starbuck and General Perryman for the job that they're playing in ensuring that the cooperative efforts of the Air Force, along with those who are today pioneering tomorrow's space history, in commercial space has a good foot up. He sent me also equipped with a proclamation to give congressional recognition to those of you in the audience today who were involved in that history-making event. Allow me to read from Congressman Walden's proclamation. Forty years ago at 10.48 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on January 31st, 1958, a modified Army Redstone rocket known as Jupiter 
lifted off from Launch Complex 26 at Cape Canaveral Air Station, Florida. Atop that rocket was a cylindrical-shaped craft only six feet long, six inches in diameter, carrying just over 10 pounds of scientific instrumentation to study the environment of space. Upon reaching orbit, the tiny craft was given the name Explorer 1 and became the first satellite placed in orbit by the United States. Today, 40 years after that historic event, we have witnessed in the legacy of Explorer 1 such spectacular achievements in the exploration of space as man walking on the moon, planetary probes traveling far beyond our solar system, and a robot explorer roaming the surface of the planet Mars. Satellites are now a part of our everyday lives, from early warning forecasts, from weather satellites, global communications, accurate navigation in the air, on land, and at sea, with small handheld satellite receivers, to the small dish antennas found in backyards for home television reception directly from satellites. It all began with the thunderous roar of a rocket lifting off from Cape Canaveral, carrying this nation's first satellite into space from that historic launch site. This is now home of the United States Air Force Space and Missile Museum, where on January 31st, 1998, people will gather to remember Explorer 1, to look back on all the strides we've made in space exploration over the past 40 years, and perhaps ponder what the next 40 years will bring. Now, therefore, I, Dave Weldon, as Congressional Representative for District 15, the district which includes the launch site of Explorer 1, and on behalf of my colleagues in our nation's capital, in order that we may justly honor the launch of America's first satellite and more fully acknowledge the contributions of our nation's space program and all of the people who have made it possible, do hereby pro proclaim this day, January 31, 1998, as Explorer One Day. I remind all of our citizens that the continued development of space and space exploration is vital to our economy and national security. And we must remember the important place in history that the little satellite holds, not only in the history of the United States, but in the history of the greatest adventure ever, the exploration of space. In witness whereof, I have here to under to set my hand this 31st day of January in the year of our Lord, 1998, and of the independence of the United States of America. Dave Weldon, Member of Congress. General Starbuck, it's my pleasure to present this proclamation to you and the men and women of the 45th Space Force. Thank you very much. Well, you did it. You lived through 38 minutes and 22 seconds worth of long-winded speeches. Not one, not two, not three, not four, but five long-winded speakers. Uh, I will tell you that what brought us to this point today started 40 years ago. But what makes this celebration important is the Space and Missile Museum. And I would like to salute Emily Perry and all the volunteers for the great work they did putting this together. Emily, where are you? And uh, I would invite up uh, the, uh, the person who's kind of helped us out with uh, laying out the schedule and all, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Randy Horn of uh, Cape Canaveral. Randy? Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the formal ceremony. Thank you for coming. Uh, please visit the exhibits in the Space Fair, and don't forget uh, the, mo uh, the model rocket launch at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much.
Jeez, gluing it together is crazy glue. Do you have any super glue in your toolbox? When they pick up the count. You running? Running. Probably right into the sun. Hey, Klaus, yeah. you turn, if you pan left real quick, you can catch it coming down. Okay. Okay. I'll go ahead. All right. I'll run now. Go ahead. Okay. What's your name? I'm Patrick McCarthy. How'd you? Where are you from, Patrick? I live in Rockledge, and I work out here at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station for Computer Sciences Raytheon. Uh huh. And my friend Mike is a volunteer docent here at the museum, and he asked me if I'd help him with the project for the commemoration of the 40th anniversary of Explorer 1 launch. And I said, yeah, I've got a rocket. So I started a couple weeks ago and spent about 50 hours or so putting it together. It's a standard model rocket made out of paper, balsa wood, plastic, powered by a 
commercially available motor, uh, G80. How long did it take you to build it? I'd say about 50 hours or so, all told. Uh -huh. And uh, you do this other place elsewhere? Or? Yes, we fly regularly in, uh, around Brevard County, generally down in Palm Bay at a couple of big fields down there and occasionally out at Vieira. How long have you been doing this kind of thing? Uh, probably about 25 years or so. I picked years. it up when I was a kid and high never school? really, even around high school and never really gave it up. Been flying ever since. Been to some national competitions and uh, things like that and uh, really enjoy the hobby and never grew out of it, I guess. Oh, very good. Uh, let's see. Uh, Explain the rocket a little bit more, that the space cap on top, how it sits on there. Does that spin? No, nah, it's bounced on, it's not what, gonna spin now. What kind of fuel does that use? I use ammonium perchlorate fuel, just like in the space shuttle solid rocket boosters. Uh, a little bit less energetic, of course. Uh -huh. uh, they, the motor produced about uh, 22 pounds of thrust at liftoff, and the average thrust was about 18 pounds. It burned for about a second and a half. And reached an altitude of? We expected it to be about 800 to 900 feet. Uh-huh. Uh, anybody think of any other questions? What? Pat, talk a little bit about the rocket. I mean, the fin, what the UE is, what, what the stuff on the top is. Where is Explorer 1 on that? Ah. Yeah, show the Explorer 1. Okay, well, the... The booster section, the redstone, goes from here all the way up to, to here. Uh, there's some sergeant upper stage motors inside the tub here, which uh, were the third stage and the fourth stage in the Explorer vehicle is just the very pointy part up on top here, because the, ori the uh, original only weighed, what, about 13 pounds or so. And uh, so the entire vehicle was devoted just to putting that 13 pounds into orbit. What's the insignia about? On the side. Ah, the UE. Well, the, the folks from Huntsville uh, put codes on their rockets, and the UE came from. Uh, Jim, you'll have to remind me some on that because I know it depended on. Letters of Huntsville. Two nine. So this was uh, Redstone number twenty nine, and so they, the letters from Huntsville sort of spelled out uh, the numerical sequence of of the boosters that they did. So you'll see some of the other Explorer models will have different codes on them, depending on uh, the order in which they were flown. Okay. Uh, Is this the largest rocket you've ever built as well? Uh, no, it's not. I've, I've built some that are a little bit taller than this. This is probably uh, the heaviest one, and it's definitely the biggest one I've flown in front of a, a crowd at a demonstration. What are you going to do for your next uh, big project? Well, the uh, 50th anniversary of the first launch here at the Cape, the Bumper 8 launch, uh, in the year 2000, we're looking forward to that. In fact, this was the big end for us to, to do this demonstration if we got this one successfully under our belt. And hopefully we'll be selected or chosen to, to put on the Bumper 8 commemorative launch uh, in a couple of years. Certainly any kid can do it. You can buy the model rocket kits in any hobby shop or uh, toy store, and you can buy the motors all pre-assembled. In fact, it's a very inexpensive hobby for for kids and it's great for learning science and math and it's really exciting because you get to run around outside and chase rockets. Just loads of fun, built in scale models, and, uh, gliders and competition models and everything. How long have you worked out here? I've been out at the Cape for about 10 years. Any relatives work here during that original launch? No, we didn't, we didn't live in the state back then. Of course, I was born just a couple of months before Explorer and so I would, I'm celebrating my 40th anniversary as well this year. Okay. Pat, talk for a second about the museum and what it's like for you to come out and visit and what you hope folks feel about when they come out here. Well, this is certainly an inspiration to, to come out here and see how things were done in the, in the good old days. Uh, as they say, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. And in fact, when you come out here, I, I'm always inspired to see the, the, the history and the uh, dedication of the, the people that worked out here in the early days and, and what they accomplished. And it's, uh, it, it inspires me to, to do good work on the, the things that I do now because I'm a program manager for CSR out here at the Cape and uh, coming out to the museum I like to do once every couple of months just to get rejuvenated and uh, excited about what I'm doing. Uh, one last time, will you say your name and spell it please? Patrick McCarthy, M-C-C-A-R-T-H-Y. Okay, thank you.
Anybody else? Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. How about that?